Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. I'm your co-host, Debbie Cox Bolton. In this episode, I speak with David Pepper. David's a former Cincinnati City Council member and Hamilton County Commissioner. He's also former chair of the Ohio Democratic Party, and he's a best-selling author. We asked David to join us to talk about his new book, Saving Democracy, a user's manual for every American, which is a bottom-up guide with specific actions every single American can take, no matter who they are or where they live. David talks about the importance of understanding the current attack on democracy is a long-term struggle that's been going on for generations, and how currently pro-democracy Americans are playing on a totally different field than our opponents. To save democracy, we need to play and win on their field, from registering more voters to contesting every election and holding extremists accountable. We need to recognize the importance of state legislatures and unleash the power that city and county officials have, as well as think about banning terms like off your elections and the political bench. This is a really important conversation. I hope after you listen, you'll join me in getting the book and making a personal plan to help save democracy. David Pepper, welcome to an honorable profession. Thank you. Good to be with you. I'm so happy to see you. We've known each other a long time. Back in the days, as I was talking about in the intro, when you were an elected official and Democratic Party chair of Ohio. But I am so excited to have you today because you have a new book out. It's a super important book. It's called Saving Democracy, a user's manual for every American. And I just want to talk about this book. And I want to tell people about this book because I think it's really important what you've done. I'm in a book club. <laughs> And my friends, you know, with non-political people, my friends are asking me, you're in politics. What can I do? What can I do about this problem? And so you have written a book that lays out for everybody, no matter what you do for a living, you know, what people can do to save democracy. So I'm really excited to have you talk about this. And I thought maybe I would just start kind of where you started before we get into the, the prescription piece of just some things that struck me. And first of all, I was struck by just the reminder that this is a very long fight. This is not new. I think sometimes we feel it's new. I feel like, why is this happening now? What did we do wrong? (laughs) Why are we in this mess? And you kind of reset that for me and say, and remind me that this has been a very long arc of history and that this is actually the struggle for democracy or the fight for democracy is really the story of America. That's okay. We're in it. We got to be in it. We got to stay in it. Tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really, once you realize that we're not in some special time different from the rest of our country's history or other countries' history, where somehow democracy is just magically intact, then that lets us, once you see that, no, actually, we're just the same. We're in a battle for democracy. I think it, it, and that battle is a long battle. It's a light, it's a, it's our nation's struggle. It's the same battle the suffragists were in and John Lewis were in. I think once you see that that's the perspective versus just somehow it's some magical every two year federal election, once you have that long perspective, I think it really helps you think through every strategy, how many mistakes we're making when we gear up and then shut everything down for a year and a half and then gear up again. John Lewis didn't stop after a November and uh, an even year when he was fighting for civil rights and American democracy. He knew it was a long battle that sometimes involves elections. But other times involves things that aren't about elections. And once I think even though it's sort of sobering, like you said, to realize we're in that same battle, one, it's reality. But two, I think it's empowering because you start to see, oh, you mean there's so many things I could be doing above and beyond your typical election work all the time. And even in years that feel like a tougher year, let's say you don't win that U.S. Senate seat you hope to win. You may still have made great progress for democracy, even if you didn't win a federal election. But right now, the way we see everything politics, which is everything's about the next federal election, that's it. I think we really 
we aren't planning right, we're not strategizing right. And oftentimes we're kind of disempowering ourselves because we think in the end, there's a lot less to do or that we could do to make a difference than is actually the case. So I hope that long view really inspires people to see that there's much more they can do. There's much more progress being made. And my, my great example that in the book is Stacey Abrams. If she had not seen that the battle for democracy in Georgia was a long battle, she would have never won the battle. And she did win it. And yeah. she didn't quit the first time the state was red in a federal year. She would have quit years ago because she understood that the, to win that battle was not just about the next U.S. Senate race or a House race. It was about registering voters and protecting against suppression. And when she ran herself, she lifted people. She didn't quite win that race. But boy, did she make progress towards democracy. And then in 20, we all saw what happened. So once you have a long frame, I actually think it really empowers us to do a lot more and to keep going at times where otherwise we might get a little tired. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Of course, I have to put the plug in that Stacey Abrams is a New Deal leader, of course, and one of our, we, we love her. She's doing amazing work. Along those lines, Ava, the other thing that was really struck me as I was getting into the book was the way that you've reframed the fight or the battle and that people, you you talk about team A and team D, and you talk about the fact that we're playing totally different games. We are on totally different battlefields. That was really eye-opening to me. I, I think that the way you described team D described exactly how I think about things, to be honest, and I do this for a living. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that was, that was really a, a, a game changer for me. Sure. And it described me too, until I started really getting into this stuff. I worry that we all think about the battle of American politics is a single battle between red and blue as if both sides are doing the same thing. And the more I've kind of written and thought and thought and presented, the more I think that's a really damaging oversimplistic view. There is a team that cares about democracy. And by the way, it's more than just Democrats. I think it's, I mean, independents. I have some former Republicans who have been really helpful lifting my message. So it's not only partisan. There's a broad mainstream of America that does support democracy. But this side has won, as we said in the earlier answer, it sort of got to the place where for too long, not so much recently, it took democracy for granted. So it didn't think it was potentially in danger. But the second thing about this side is it actually assumes largely correctly that it stands with the majority of people on most of the things it cares about. So because of the belief in democracy and the confidence that you can go win elections, talking about what you're for, this side very quickly focuses on election outcomes, almost entirely focused on federal elections, which almost entirely means swing states in federal years. And when this side wins those federal elections, we've all been there, like you said, we celebrate like in 08 or 2020, we think we've won the whole battle, don't we? And we celebrate like we won and articles are written. And by the way, the media covers it all this way too. Articles are written. What is the Republican Party gone forever, which happened after 08? Here's the problem with that celebration. The other side's battle isn't what I just described. It's actually very different. One, they understand that the real history of our country is democracy is not magically intact. It can be subverted. It has been subverted many times. That's how we got Jim Crow. But secondly, this side, again, it's not every Republican either. I, I want to say that there are Republicans I respect who are standing up for democracy. But many of them, and Mitch McConnell, I'd say, is one of these people, actually, they understand that their viewpoint, their agenda is a minority viewpoint. Many ways, it's toxic. And they know that if they were simply to run an election about their viewpoint, let's say that so every election was a referenda on their agenda, they know they would lose again and again and again. Mitch McConnell would know that Kansas, that referendum last August, would be the outcome. People are pro-choice. They are not for banning books. They're for public schools. You name it. They know it's a losing unpopular agenda. So their battle is different than winning elections as ours is in a, on a sort of fair playing field. Their battle ends up being how do you undermine democracy enough to lock in a minority worldview over time that would never win in a fair democracy? And by the way, that sounds a little edgy. But when you're studying Orban in Hungary and then you invite him back to Texas, you're not really hiding that that's really what you're thinking about because that's what he's done in Hungary. But to wage that battle, they can't just focus on swing states in federal years. They would lose, just like John Fetterman beat Mehmet Oz, even when a year we had the White House. How do they accomplish their battle? And this is sort of the whole point of the first book and the second book. State houses are the perfect institution to lock in a minority worldview over time. Why? Because state houses control every single aspect of all of our political agenda. 
including theirs, like banning books and attacking women's right to choose and gun laws and everything else. But secondly, through gerrymandering and the ability to write the rules of our democracy, including who gets to vote and how, they can also create systems where they're not able to be held accountable. That one-two punch of substance and, and the ability and the power to create unaccountable systems is the perfect place for them to basically grab power. And so that's what they've been doing for a generation. We focus on federal swing states. They're battling every state they can grab power through state house they grab. They gerrymander, they suppress the other side, the Obama coalition essentially, and they run their extremist agenda through that state house. And they do it again. And they don't just do it in swing states. In federal years, they do it whenever they can. And so as I go through in the book, and this is, I hope this is sort of an aha moment for people. If they keep doing what they're doing and we keep doing what we're doing, who's going to win? Even when we think we're winning, we're losing like 20 because they are still in state houses. I use the soccer game analogy that, that I have a nine and a six year old, as you know, that play soccer. Well, they're always on offense. They're going to win. My nine year old understands that when he's playing soccer. They are always on offense in the places that shape democracy. Unfortunately, we're often not even on defense. Think of their offense. It's gerrymandered, unaccountable state houses shooting at the goal again and again and again. It's Mississippi State House with Dobbs. It's the Ohio State House, the Wisconsin State House. They're shooting shot at goal after goal after goal. And as I go, as I go through in this book, often we're not even challenging them. We don't even contest half the races. Of course they're going to win. When we sort of, after moments of loss, we often will say, well, we need more U.S. senators. That's like demanding after 10 people are shooting it without, without blocking the shot that we need a better goalie. We need to understand that they are right, that we are in a battle for democracy, and that the front line of their battle are state houses, and we better get to those state houses and start running with more vigor, with more support, to start holding them accountable and often beating them because they've gotten so extreme. So I know that's a long answer, but there are two battles. We haven't seen their battle for too long, and we've got to go to where the battle is and not simply think we're going to win by fighting this very surface-level battle at the federal level. Yeah. No. Well, and on that piece, you're talking to the choir. Obviously, this is something that we met because we were both working on state and local elected official, right. elected offices and, and policy and governing. And so that was the other thing that struck me about this book is just even though this is a book about what every American can do, no matter what you do for a living to be a democracy champion. You talk a lot about the role that state and local leaders play. And given that our audience is a lot of state and local leaders and their staff, maybe I'll just ask you to take a minute to just expand a little bit on kind of why this obviously talked about the state houses, both. The, their ability to set the substantive agenda, but also their ability to write the rules about elections themselves. You talk a little bit about mayors and counties as well. Just maybe another couple of sentences on why those people are so important in this. Honestly, this is why I was so excited to talk to you about what you're doing. And I was excited to be with you in Philadelphia. And I love the group you put together. I actually think there is no more powerful an army to lift democracy than the local officials, including the ones you brought together. The state houses are attacking democracy largely through tar- gerrymandering, one thing, but also largely through targeting the voters of cities. And I, I look back, and this is not to point fingers anyone else. I was a city council member, as you know, as a county commissioner. And I never thought to myself at the time, the, the democracy was not quite as under assault then, although it was beginning as it is now. But I never thought, hey, part of my role as a city council member and a county commissioner is to register voters in my community. I did earn income tax credit help, which I learned at one of the conferences we were at together. Jack Mark Kelson, who taught me about that. But I didn't think I could play a role in actually lifting the citizens of Cincinnati and Hamilton County into democracy. Well, now I know they are the target of so much of this attack. The voters of these communities, because the people in these states don't like how they potentially will vote. There is no bigger source of lifting these voters back into the democracy they're being removed from through systematic purging, new voter ID laws, than the footprint of every city hall and every county in this country where, again, Democrats or just anyone who's pro-democracy is in charge. And so what I would ask, it's in the book. I have a website called SaveDemocracy.us where I give best practices Every mayor that's part of the New Deal network or part of a broader network of mayors that care about democracy, you could play a bigger role in lifting democracy than virtually anybody. If I were a mayor now or a council member, you should feel motivated by almost anger that your citizens are the ones that are being forcibly removed from our democracy by horrible voter suppression. So here's some examples. You know, every rec center of a city 
could be registering voters to come in or showing them how to get a voter ID. Every health clinic, if you happen to run them, every health clinic you fund, even if you don't run them, every library, all these places, think about every one of them could be like the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Because you're a city, you are serving the voters most likely to been have removed from, let's say, a purging process like Ohio or other states that are removing the, the less engaged, less repeating voters. So not only is it adding to the scale of the effort to have every city hall or every county take part, you are actually going to be engaging the voters more likely to be caught up in this uh, suppression effort than the typical Democratic Party effort, which usually is targeting the most repetitive voters. So think about it this way to all the mayors who are listening or those who know mayors. Every 10 years, cities get geared up to maximize their census count. They put together entire committees, right? Hey, let's get every community that cares about being fully represented census and let's go count our people. Well, I say we have to do the same thing to be fully counted our democracy. And it's not every 10 years, it's all the time. So, and I'm working with some mayors on this already, but I'd love to work with you and talk to anyone who agrees with me. I think potentially the single greatest source to lift the targeted purge voters back into democracy that these state houses are intentionally removing them from are all the cities that represent them through, by the way, complete nonpartisan and completely legitimate activity. Again, you go to a health clinic, you're asked name, address, everything else health condition. Last question, just add it to the sign-in sheet, add it to the intake. Are you registered? Oh, you're not? We can register you right here. Did you move? Oh, you moved? Did you update your registration? That can be added simply to so many public-facing services, and the difference that would make in scale of the pro-democracy effort is astronomical. And my worry is it's just not done very much, and it's not done largely. Some people may think, well, that's too political. It's not. It's just democracy. You can it's not partisan. Do it the right way. Nonpartisan. But people think that's not really what we're supposed to do. Well, in a moment where democracy is, is under attack, it's exactly what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And if every mayor were to take this on, it would change the entire picture as soon as they started doing it. Yeah. You said a couple of really important things there that I just want to pull out. One is, and both this is on the book, but I mean, I, I do think it's super important that people understand when we're talking about democracy we're talking about something that's patriotic. This is not, absolutely. This is, <laughs> you use that word a lot. So I want to, I want to flag it. Cause I think it's ab- absolutely right. Like this is a patriotic thing, getting, making people sure that people are registered to vote. And the other thing that, that you said you, that you mentioned here, but I really struck me in the book was this whole idea. And this is one of, was one of my aha moments. You're absolutely right. I mean, I've been doing this a long time and you know, I know, campaign tactics, though I don't work on campaigns anymore. It is to talk to people who already who are voting. That's that's you have limited resources, you need to target people, you need to now you can micro target people. You say in the book, and I this was really struck me is like, actually, Democrats, you know, it's not a partisan issue. But you know, we're actually furthering the problem by essentially playing on their playing field when they're taking people off the rolls. And then we're saying, okay, those people aren't voting, we're only gonna talk to people that are vote. We got to stop that, right? It's crazy when you think about Basically, it's like a negotiation. And they say to us, hey, we'll reduce the electorate of your voters. And we say, deal. We're fine with that. We'll only talk to the voters that remain. It's horrible. I think we're almost gotten too smart for our own good. because, And this is the problem with only waiting for candidates and campaigns and parties to do this. In the end of the day, they all have limited budgets. Often these things gear up late. So in a way, it's a rational decision for them in the final month to only knock on the doors of someone who voted for the last three elections. But as a big picture matter when so many are being removed for being infrequent voters or people have decided voting hasn't mattered in my life. So I, I, I don't really think it matters anymore. It's not worth doing. When we just accept that they are no longer part of the conversation, we're losing our democracy and the people who decide that as a candidate or a party are going to lose, too. So think about all the ways that, as a matter of democracy more broadly, the homeless shelter, the food bank, the city hall I mentioned, all those places are talking to those very voters all the time and often delivering service to those voters. So in many ways, those are the best places who could incorporate lifting those voters back into democracy, those citizens back into democracy, better than parties ultimately will in the final three weeks. And by the way, the other th- reason this could be so helpful is it may be a very more meaningful conversation to that person that the food bank that's helped them in other ways that are really critical is also saying, by the way, have you registered to vote in this community? 
And since it's someone who's providing that service, you may be more attentive than the party that maybe in your area hasn't been doing much. But when we leave it only to parties, and I say this, I was a chair of a party. I'm not just here to criticize parties, but the reality is uh, right now they're skimming at the top in many elections. And that is leaving, as you said, the other side is purging the electorate. And the typical response right now is to accept that purged electorate as the new electorate. And the people left out don't get talked to. And then we wonder why J.D. Vance won a Senate race with 25 percent of the vote because more than half didn't vote. It's because we are literally allowing the suppression to win. So and this goes back to every mayor, those health clinics, those rec centers, those are directly serving people who are disproportionate. Every public housing unit, public transportation, that committee you could put together of all the nonprofits that are serving at the very local level. Those are the very places that are serving the very people that otherwise no one is talking to in a meaningful way that are being literally targeted for purging nonstop. So I'm glad that you liked that part. You saw that little diagram, right? I mean, that diagram, I'm going to do a whiteboard on this a few days. Like when I made it, I mean, I was re frustrated just looking at it. The fact that we're accepting this, this suppression world as sort of the new given, and it's a huge mistake long term, and it's terrible for democracy long term that we have so many people just not engaged at all, and then we're not engaging them. Yeah. And so that's a big part of your book is what you're saying. And there's and there's lots of other ways in the book that we didn't even get to about how you register voters, how you engage people, how you talk to people using your own, whoever you are, personal networks. And you have lots of examples that are awesome. I do have some questions that arose for me on as I was reading your book. Okay. That I think probably other people will have too. One is you lay out a lot of really smart strategies, including first and foremost, as you were just talking about competing everywhere, making sure that, you know, there are pro-democracy candidates, right, in every single seat across the country, they're well-funded. Money. So some money comes up, right? And this you have some edgy stuff, right. but I think but I think you're absolutely right. So how do we do this? How do we fund a take back democracy effort generally? That's a great question. And this comes up all the time. Okay, David, Mr. Run Everywhere, how do you actually do that? And I think one thing that we don't appreciate enough When the pro-democracy side gets fired up, it's actually very powerful. It actually leads to a whole lot of grassroots money. You saw that happen in the Wisconsin Supreme Court race a few months ago. All of a sudden, people are throwing money at a candidate they've ever heard of in a state they're far away from, but they understood that the the democracy of Wisconsin was at stake, and all of a sudden, millions of dollars flow that way. So there's there's that, and I give the example, Amy McGrath running against Mitch McConnell. People around the country thought, wow, beating Mitch McConnell will help lift our cause. Let's beat him. Let's give to Amy Grass. She raised $100 million. The point is there is money out there. There's energy out there to make phone calls, too, and all the other stuff. But we have not had a conversation in a broader way saying, well, actually, let's think for a second about what a real democracy strategy looks like. And it's not only giving to a a race like the Mitch McConnell race that all of a sudden is the the cause celebre at the moment where we get excited, you'll agree with this. I don't follow Amy McGrath for raising a lot of money. That's what a candidate's supposed to do. So I don't say this as a criticism, but if we all said collectively, you know, let's help beat Mitch McConnell, let's hold him accountable. But even if we took 15 or 20% of the money that went to that race, which was basically additional TV spend, and we put it into uncontested state house races in states surrounding Kentucky, we'd be funding 40, 50, 60, 70 candidates. And so I think what we need to do is come up with mechanisms. And I go through several examples in the book of mechanisms that are emerging. The States Project is a wonderful operation where people are adopting state houses and their money is going into certain candidates that can flip power in those state houses. They played a big role in flipping Pennsylvania and Michigan and the Minnesota Senate. And then I go through an example in Ohio where I basically have started a crowdfunding pack that takes $10 and $15 a monthly give amounts and gives it to the toughest districts. So the truth is that the dollars are there when we get excited, but we need more mechanisms that A, show people protecting democracy actually has to start a level lower than we're all watching. And it has to start in places that we too often aren't even competing in. Once we have people paying attention to that, and I think people are starting to see that, we then need some mechanisms that make it as easy to help those candidates as it is to go on a website and give money in McGrath. And in the book, I go through how those things are being created as well. So it can be done. I'm not naive about the difficulty of it, but it has to be done. The opposite, we've been trying for a long time, haven't we? Let's allow 
50 percent of the of the Tennessee Republicans in that state house to go uncontested. Let's allow 60 percent plus of Oklahoma state house Republicans to go uncontested. Let's let millions of Texans not have a choice at the Texas state house. How's that working out? Yeah. The point is, when you have these entire political worlds like we have allowed to create, they're not just gerrymandered, which is already bad. They're not being contested. Extremism will go through the downward spiral. We're seeing, we're seeing you know, I go through in the book, and I, I hope you saw this part. All the incentives in a world where no one runs against these people encourage more extremism. They encourage worse public outcomes. It's all public service from a broader sense is completely corrupted. The single best way to fight against that is to start bringing accountability back to these places. And that starts with running in as many places as possible. And that means we have to build an infrastructure that values doing so. And there are ways to do it. And I, knowing that that's a, a very good con- question, I point to some of the best practices that are out there that are doing exactly this. And our mission together and all around has to be, we need to have those pieces of infrastructure go from being sort of side they're sort of on the side, right? They're not core. We need to start seeing those pieces of infrastructure as part of the core mission of those who care about democracy and not sort of a side nice thing that, that you think about long after you've helped win a few Senate and House seats. But yeah. it's there and it's building very quickly. And I'm an optimist about all this stuff. And it worked very well in Kansas with that abortion referendum. It helped us flip state houses and win sector of state races last November against election deniers. And then it rolled right on through and helped us win a Supreme Court of Wisconsin. So it can be done, but we have to really sort of build up, scale up and have it be more central in the overall effort. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And you know that I totally agree with you (laughs) on on strategy. We've got, you know, we just can't, we can't seed so much ground. I mean, yeah. you, you lay out why that's so important, particularly on this idea that this just breeds more extremism and that everybody's does. with extremism and that's where we are. Well, we've got to do something about Absolutely. that. And here's the thing. You're not going to win all these places, but think of the difference when we're not there at all. When we're not there at all, their extremism, which is out of touch with their own people, just look again, look at Kansas. That's like a bat signal. They are out of touch with their states. They're too extreme, but also they're terrible public outcomes. There are roads and towns collapsing and rural schools falling apart. But if we're not there knocking on doors of the community saying, well, the reason your school is falling apart is they defunded it in that state house. If we're not even there saying that, whenever there's a problem, they're going to blame it on some caravan they've made up coming from Mexico, or they're going to blame it on Washington. And so when you're not there, even if you, let's say, aren't going to win that district, you're starting to get the message more balanced. You're starting to bring accountability. You might make them think twice about destroying their rural public school, for example, if they know, well, someone next November is going to knock on, or August, September, November, whatever, is going to knock on tens of thousands of doors and pass out flyers and talk to newspapers about what I'm doing. So when we're not there, we not only encourage the worst of it, but we also, you know, we don't have a message explaining what's actually happening because most of the problems in Parts of this country that are struggling, let's say rural Ohio, have nothing to do with a caravan from Mexico and not that much to do with Washington, although some. It has more to do with a state house that's been taking resources of that community for decades and be giving it away. We're not even there to explain that. That's right. And you have a whole chapter on accountability, which I think is super important, which is this is a core part of this is holding people accountable, right? I mean, which leads me to another question that I had, and you touch on it in the book, but I think another key part of accountability is local journalism. And we're running into this democracy problem at the same time that local journalism is on the decline. Media in general has become this kind of entertainment. It incentivizes more extreme voices, right? So how do you think about journalism and democracy? The big picture, think about everything that makes state houses the perfect place to attack democracy. Gerrymandering, that tool makes them perfect. The fact that they control every almost substantive issue we care about makes them very good. But the fact that no one has any idea what they do for the most part makes them, if you're the Koch brothers or Alec, perfect. And the decline of local journalism makes that problem even worse. There already would be a problem. I'm sure state house members that you know would tell us this. People generally don't aren't as aware of what state houses do. But if that old local mid-sized town paper is gone, the coverage of that individual lawmaker just disappeared. And that's a real problem. It's why those people can pass insane bills that no one supports that gave away the store to some private player. And no one knows about it. Not only are they larger papers than big city papers reducing, you know, their state house bureaus, 
And that's a problem. So the people of Cincinnati don't read as much about Columbus, but the small town paper just disappears or gets gobbled up. And so there's no attention on the individual office holder. Again, that breeds their sense that they can't be held accountable. So this new book is all about solutions. So I wish there was a perfect solution here. There really isn't. Uh, one is that everyone can be their own information warrior. And I go through a lot on what you can do to play a role to yourself and groups you're part of advocate at the state house, even if that paper isn't there anymore. Secondly, though, I do say you know, we got to put our money where democracy is. So if there is a local paper and they are covering this stuff, don't go to the paywall. Don't try and figure out how to get around the paywall. They need our help. Lift them up. If they're doing a good job. And the third one that's maybe the most promising as a matter of journalism is there are some really good nonprofit journalism models that are building up. Yep. And in some states, they become very robust. In Texas, the Texas Tribune is an example. In Ohio, any of your listeners follow on Twitter, the Ohio Capital Journal. They are building a really good reputation of real reporting. It ends up populating the pages of other newspapers and TV stations. If you're someone who cares enough to do this and you're listening, support these nonprofits because they are filling the gap where a lot of these other papers are, are really struggling. So what we all have to figure out how do we fill that, in, that, that information void? And if that includes your own noise, great. If that includes lifting up those who are trying to do it, great as well. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think there are models out there. And I'm hoping to get Tara McGowan on here sometime soon to talk about what she's doing with Courier. And I think there are really great models. Of, but, yeah. but I agree that it's hand in hand, that, that accountability. There's so much I want to talk to you about. I'm trying to sneak in more questions. Another thing that struck me in your book is you're talking about language. And I have a question about that. So so a couple of my favorite examples you talked about, again, even people who do this for a living, right? How we talk about things. Off your elections, you said, well, I want to ban that <laughs> that term. Yeah. And that's exactly right. Because by saying it's an off your election, you're acting like it doesn't matter. Of course, tons of local and state races are taking place in the, I'm using my air quotes, no one can see off your elections. We're going to call them the, the election for the year that it is. This is super important. You also talk about one of my favorites is, you know, not talking about state and local leaders as a bench. These people are uh -huh. on the front lines right now. This is not, they're not value is not that they're going to only be, you know, members of Congress. It's what they're right. doing today. Talk about that. But also the one that you didn't mention, and I know this is a Simon Rosenberg one that he puts in my ear all the time is the term election denier. He's like, I don't like that term. It's too soft, right? It, it makes them, it makes them sound like that's a choice that you can actually deny an election. And that's a thing. It's not a thing. You can't deny an election. <laughs> So I'm right. curious about, right. you know, you're thinking just generally broadly about language. Maybe specifically. Yeah, we really frame it. Do you think the Koch brothers think of the state houses they've locked up through Alec as the bench? No, that's the source of their power. <laughs> and I love when Mallory McMorrow a few weeks ago announced she wasn't running for the Michigan Senate. She uh, basically said this. Yes. When we call it the bench, we are framing it as some JV political squad, democracy team. No. Most of the damage being done in our country is not Marjorie Taylor Greene or George Santos, as outrageous they are. It's hundreds of people just like them back in state houses no one's ever heard of. And they're passing laws and governors are signing them. And not only are they not the bench, in many of these states like Ohio and Arizona, when Doug Ducey was governor and other states, they are running over more moderate governors because yeah. they are so unaccountable. Those governors feel like I don't agree with it, they, that they can't, but they're not even staying up to them. So they're so powerful, they are running over much better known political figures than themselves. And so we have to say to people when they run for state house or school board, hey, if down the road you want to do something else, wonderful. But right now, the best thing you could do is the job you're in and do a great job at it. And if you never run for anything else, great. You were an amazing public servant when democracy called. Thank you. How can we help? And I don't want to sit around and talk to you about some run for something else. It's the front line. The other side knows it's the front line. That's why they put entire infrastructures behind lifting it up. Off year, get rid of that. Bench, that one bothers me even more, honestly, because it's so minimizing of the role. Right now, school board, you are truly the front line. If you're a county official, which I was at one point, naming a library board member, front line. It's hard for them, although they tried on January 6th, it's hard for them to attack democracy straight up through Washington. It's much easier for them to do it at the state house level and other local positions that affect these issues. It's not their bench. It better not be ours. And, and we need to reframe. People ask me all the time, well, here's another way to reframe it. 
when someone runs for office in a hard district, let's make sure we they understand that we know their public service began the day they started running. We don't say to them, oh, thanks for winning. Now you're doing public service. In an age where democracy is under attack and the lack of accountability is the key ingredient to the extremism, running for those nine months or a year, however long they do it, and every act they do as part of that running, they are being a patriot and they are performing public service. And if they don't win because it's so gerrymandered, that's too bad. But their public service went on the entire time they were running. And you want to recruit better? That's how you. That's what you say from the beginning to the end. And when it's over, you keep on saying, incredible, you did that. Let's go again. Let's do some more public service next election. We have to wrap candidates with a better frame of why their running is valued. And right now, we frame it too much as not only if you win is at a bench, but if you don't win, we don't even value that you ran when we need to we need to value it you know, in an extraordinary way. Yeah, no, I think that's really fantastic. And maybe I'll end on this question, which is summing up what you just said a little bit. But like, I do think that I'm just going to let you reiterate, frankly, but a lot of what the message I felt like came out of the 2022 election is like, or even the 2020, right? Who democracy held, right? And it did. Trump is not in office. And last, the 22, I was going to say the midterms, but I mean, I'm going to say that the, the 2022 elections, right, where so many New Dealers and others, secretaries of states held ground and, you know, and beat election deniers or whatever we're going to start calling them. But to your point, we can't celebrate. That was actually, yes, that's great that those things happened, but so many other bad things happened as well. And that we have to keep on just kind of, again, maybe finishing on just kind of the sense of urgency. Sure, about two this. things. One, when they lose, they fight harder than ever. We had our Wisconsin moment in Ohio when we flipped a third out of four seats for the Ohio Supreme Court and got ourselves an independent bipartisan majority. And they immediately changed the rules of how we elect justices and ignored court rulings for two years. So the one thing is when you feel like you've made progress, if you have, they will not only not quit, they will come back harder. Like Wisconsin, I, I worry about what they're going to do now that they lost that court seat. But number two, we're not really winning until we're winning on their turf, which is these state houses. So yes, Trump losing was incredibly important. Not losing the U.S. Senate and the House, incredibly important. But I would submit the biggest wins, and this is why we should have hope for 24, the real victory of 22 was the Pennsylvania State House and the Michigan State. We went to where they've been winning, and we beat them there. And now look at the result in Michigan. We've got a whole pro-democracy effort building through the Michigan trifecta in Minnesota, too. So that's winning. And the reason I'm optimistic about 24 is their extremism, which they've hidden well for a long time, it's not hidden, folks. Dobbs revealed it. Marjorie Taylor Greene is the face of Congress. It's revealed. Trump and DeSantis are going to be a downward spiral of extremism. We all see it. So their successful effort about pretending they weren't that off the charts recently is kind of a failure. That's one reason 22 was pretty good for us. That's why every, I'll use Simon's not term done like, that's why every election and I are running for Secretary of State in a swing state lost. It seemed too extreme. So in 24, here's the opportunity for everybody. If we all start now, including every mayor getting every single voter re-engaged has been purged, their extremism is clear. It's going to stay clear. And we have an infrastructure that succeeded in 22 in winning state houses we haven't been winning, in winning other offices we have paid attention to, and even winning Wisconsin Supreme Court race. If we can pair their extremism and be smart enough in 24 not to just focus on the presidency and a few Senate races and House seats, but to run the opportunity all the way down through the state house level, that's when we start really having real wins, not just for a short-term federal mindset, but real wins for democracy. So I wrote the book. As you can imagine, I wrote it as fast as I could because I wanted people to start seeing there is a big opportunity around the corner. And it's not just because of federal offices. It's because there's some things in the air, recent success that were counter cyclical and how crazy they've gotten that I think if we pair it all up, we can have a very good coming years for democracy. If we see the battle for what it is and if we take all the steps I walk through in my book that every single American can take. Not just those in swing states, not just those on the jury in Florida that's going to look at Trump. There are so many things that every single American can do to push in that direction. So my hope is the book helps people find those ways in their neck of the woods. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for writing this. Honestly, thank you for writing this. 
Everybody get this for your family, get this for your book club. <laughs> it's really important. And I'm looking forward to working with you more with the elected officials around the country on this issue. Absolutely. They are the front lines. Your members are the front lines. And I love the report you guys already did explain that. There's a lot of good best practices in that and even a lot more to explore. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to doing it with you. So thanks for coming on, David. It's so great to see you. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. Thanks to the team at New Deal for producing this episode. We encourage you to bring honor to public service. And because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars are used in the making of this podcast.